so much for keeping Tabby and Tyler and their family in your prayers. Needless to say, it's a quite shocking thing that has come upon us, but we'll deal with it because God will be with us. And um, my, ho- my throat's a little bit hoarse this morning, um, so you have to forgive that. I, I was listening to Rick Popejoy preach yesterday, so I kind of got my throat hoarse. <laughs> One thing about Rick, he gets there, and that's where he's at. And uh, I got a clue for you preachers, too, just a little old man experience. If you want to draw a crowd, here's what you do. You make friends, and you show these young people, these little children, that you love them and care for them, and they will get their mommies and daddies out of bed, and they will get them here for you. And that is by experience. I learned that. And, And our children are all here, a bunch of them, and they know I love them, and I think they love me. So we're on good ground. Our lesson this morning is quite a difficult one. First of all, because the Bible does teach us, and much preaching has been done this week, concerning the cross of Christ. I don't need to repeat what has already been said. If it were not for the cross of Christ, you and I would not have any need whatsoever to be here today. But we are here because we know there is hope in the cross. We know that when Jesus went there and he decided to come to this earth and be in a human form, John chapter chapter 1, verse 14, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. We see Jesus incarnate in the flesh. And so therefore you and I know that he come to this earth to save us, you and me, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us on the cross. We know that you're not going to get to heaven without going through Christ and that cross. And if you look at John chapter 14 and you look there at verse 6, where Jesus talks about him being the way, the truth, and the life, and no man cometh unto the Father but by him. And so how there are those individuals that cannot center their thoughts and their mind upon Christ Jesus, our Lord and our Savior, I am somewhat astonished. But one of the things, turn to 1 Corinthians, if you would, and I want us to look there, and we'll start at verse 17, and probably go through about verse 30. For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. I want to stop there for just a second, because this statement is made by the Apostle Paul. For Christ sent me not to baptize. Don't misunderstand that. Paul is not saying baptism is not essential. He's saying, I did not come just to baptize, but I come to preach the whole counsel of God, the full gospel of Jesus Christ. And because of that result, because of people listening and understanding and doing what God says, then they will be baptized into Christ. And he goes on to say, but to preach the gospel not with wisdom of words. In other words, don't waste words. Don't have people thinking, look at me, what I'm doing. Brother Brent did a fantastic job the other day of describing this. When we are in this pulpit, we are to be seen through. In other words, no matter how great a person might be in their oration, no matter how many great and wonderful words that they might be able to speak, no matter how they might sway an audience, they're to be seen through. You and I, when you see me, you ought to look right through me and see the cross back here that is being preached. That is what God wants us to do. Not with the wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be of none effect. Can we, by our preaching, this is the question, Can we, by our preaching, make the cross of Christ of none effect? Brethren, we must be distinctive in our preaching. It's not time for us to wash it away, to piddle with it, to make an audience feel good about themselves. Sure, I believe I could get up here this morning. I think I could do this about every week. 
I could get up and I could tell you how great and wonderful you are and don't worry about anything. Everything's going to be all right in your life. And I could be like those televangelists and I could fill your hearts with joy. And if you were to just look at me and believe that, and I could say, y'all be good now. I'll see you next week, okay? Be oh, by the way, be sure and bring your pocketbooks back. You know, we could do that. That's not the preaching of the cross. We must be distinctive. If the gospel is not preached, then the cross is made of none effect. It's that simple. No direct operation of the Holy Spirit is going to infiltrate your mind. You're not going to receive from God the Holy Spirit that's going to come and land in your mind or your heart and tell you or to lead you and guide you in what you're to say, like me today, preaching. You know what? I have to study. I have to study about the cross. I have to study the Word of God. I have to know what God says in order for me to preach the things that need to be preached. And the only way God works today is by the preaching of the gospel. Do we understand that? All the gimmicks, all the tricks, all the gymnasiums in the world, all the carnivals and circuses that these congregations have in their parking lots, and all those types of things are not going to get anyone to heaven. I know what they say. Oh, if we can just get them in here, if we can just pull them in by hook or crook, it really doesn't matter. We can teach them later. No, you've got to teach them now. And it's not by those gimmicks and tricks such as that. So the only way it's going to work is by preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, not by listening to anyone else. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 1, look at verse 21. For after that in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. The wisdom of man tried to outthink God, tried to bring God down to our level and get God, try to convince him to think like we think. It's not going to work. God will not accept that. But it pleased God, notice this, it pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. How are you saved? By the preaching of the gospel. By the receiving of the gospel. You can be taught, but you have to learn. You know something? It isn't something you catch. You don't catch religion. It's not something you catch. It's something that you study, you learn. You're taught and you obey it. You're taught it from the word of God. But it's by the foolishness of preaching. You know why he says foolishness there? Because you look at people in the world today... They think preaching like we have done this week and like you do. And by the way, I want to emphasize this. I want, I want to throw this in there. It's not only the man standing in this pulpit. It's not only the person that may be teaching a Bible class during the week or whenever we come together. But you know something? In one way or the other, everyone here is a preacher. Everyone here teaches someone else. You have that opportunity. Now, there are different ways you teach, but you'd still do that. So that responsibility is upon you. Now, some people say it's foolish, the preaching, to save them to believe. Yes, it's foolish to them. But look at what Paul says in Romans chapter 1, verse 16. If we don't preach the gospel, then surely we're ashamed of it. If we don't preach the gospel, then it can't have an effect on anyone. Look at Romans 1, 16. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation unto everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Jew, Gentile, doesn't matter. Doesn't matter who you are, where you live, what country you're from. Doesn't matter what nationality you are. Doesn't matter any of those things do not matter. How wealthy you are, how educated you are, none of those things matter. They might help you in this life. But the fact is that it is through the preaching and teaching of the gospel of Christ that you and I are to give unto our fellow man, and then the Gentiles and the Jews and everyone can be saved. You know, we're all Gentiles here, don't you? <laughs> we're all Gentiles. If it were not for the gospel, you and I would be left out. If we were still back in the Old Testament, the old law, you and I would not have salvation according to the way some people think. 
But, you know, sometimes go by the wisdom of words. Context shows this to be man's wisdom, not God's wisdom. If man changes or alters the gospel, it is made of none effect. You ever know anybody to change or alter? I could stand here today, and I will do some of this, but think about denominations. Think about how they started. You know, we can go back. We can study that and don't have time to go through it today, but we can show in history where every denomination began. We can give you a date. We can give you a man. We can give you a person behind that. I want to establish this fact. A lot of people accuse us of the church, the body of Christ, of going back to Alexander Campbell and say, there you are, you're Campbellites. We've been called Campbellites. I don't know if you've lived through that era or not, but I have. I've had people call me a Campbellite. And I said, let me tell you something. Alexander Campbell is not my Christ. He's not my God. He's not my spiritual father. But I kind of respect the man in this sense that what he wanted to do and what he desired to do was to go back to the Bible and it was his father that we should speak what the Bible speaks and be silent where it's silent. And that's the idea. That's what you and I need to strive for every day of my life. And Alexander Campbell did not start the church, the body of Christ. That began on the day of Pentecost. Now, when you get to the day of Pentecost, what was preached there? What did Peter get up and do? Those very people, which was described, and I think it was Derek the other day that talked about that week when Jesus came into Jerusalem and how he was met as a king but ended up in uh, Jesus being crucified. Now listen to this. When you think about that, that is what Peter stood up on the day of Pentecost with the other 11, and he pointed to those people that were in the audience. And he said, you have crucified the Son of God. You have put him to death. You have brought Jesus to the point that he was crucified because you said, crucify him, crucify him. Some of those very people standing there that day. Oh, yeah, they probably were the ones that were saying, Hosanna, Hosanna, when he first came in. But then because of the crowds, because of false teachers, because of those that wanted to deter them and turn them away from Christ and the cross, they wanted them to have the preeminence. They wanted it. And they got some of it. And they're the very ones that stood there. And they said, crucify him, crucify him. Let the murderer go. Let the thief go. Let these individuals go. But crucify Jesus. It was a crowd mentality. And brethren, you think we don't have it? Better think again, because we do sometimes. Oh, just go along with the crowd. Some people have the idea, you know, there's an issue in the Lord's body, the church, and, and I have friends on this side and friends on this side. You know where I'm going to be? I'm going to stand with my friends. How ridiculous is that? Preaching of the cross is where you and I come to preach what Jesus said. Some preached another gospel. Well... Paul was amazed. Look at Galatians chapter 1, verses 6 through 8. He said, I marvel that you are so soon removed from that called you into the grace of Christ. And to what? Another gospel. Which is not another, but there be some that trouble you. Now, where did this come from? This came from in the church. We talk about denominationalism. We talk about when they were established. We talk about how far off they are. But do you understand that we in the body of Christ, sometimes we cause people to be lost because we're not preaching the truth? I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into grace of Christ and to another gospel, which is not another. But there be some that trouble you who would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you, notice that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. And then he repeats it again. That's important for you and me to understand. That when I get in this pulpit, when I stand in a Bible class, when I am in someone's home, when I am teaching someone, no matter where I am at, I am bound by the gospel of Christ to preach the gospel of Christ only. It's sad, very sad, 
that there are those men, there are those people, there are those elders in congregations that do not have the backbone to stand up and to stop the mouths of false teachers. Yes, if there is a false teacher in a congregation and there's elders there, then the elders have that responsibility to stop that false teaching, not tomorrow, not next week, not next month, but right now, instantly. Because somebody's going to listen, somebody's going to pay attention, they may have followers, and brethren, that's how division comes. Galatians 6, or 1, verses 6 through 8, Paul said, I marvel that ye are so soon removed you began well, you started well, but where are you ending up? You're not where you ought to be. You need to continue to grow. Also, we can be guilty of not preaching the whole counsel of God. That would make the cross of none effect. You have to be reminded of what the Apostle Paul says in Acts chapter 20, verse 20, and also we'll look at verse 27. When he turned and he was ready to leave, he called the elders at Ephesus to him. And he spoke unto them, the elders, and he said that they needed to watch over the flock. But notice what he goes on to say, that we are to feed the church, the body of Christ, we're to feed the flock. But he also says there, And how I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you, but have showed you and have taught you publicly, and from house to house, for I have not shunned to declare unto you all, all the counsel of God. Sometimes I know it's hard. And sometimes I understand. But there are those that will stand back and they'll say, Well, there are certain things that I'm not going to preach on. I'm not going to preach on these things here because it's going to upset people. And so they just shun to declare the whole counsel of God. We'll talk a little bit more about that later. But notice in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 through 4. This is the charge. Not for just a preacher, but this is a charge that Paul gave to Timothy. I charge thee therefore before God. Now you know what a charge is. That's a commandment. That is a charge. This is what you go out. This is what you preach. This is how you do it and lack nothing in doing so. But he said, Therefore, I charge thee before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead in his appearing in his kingdom, to preach the word, be instant in season and out of season. I've heard many of older gospel preachers say, that means preach it when you want to, preach it when you don't. But you've got to preach it. You've got to preach the whole counsel of God. Well, Bill, you know, we have people in our congregation that if I get too hard on this preaching thing and, and I point out their sin too distinctly, then, you know, they just might leave. Brethren, if they're living in sin, they've already left. You know, Adam and Eve, when they were in the Garden of Eden, remember that? When they had partaken and eaten of that forbidden fruit that they were not to eat of. And remember, they thought that they could clothe themselves with a few fig leaves or something like that. And then they went and hid themselves. And then God comes in a voice and he says, Where art thou? It's not that God did not know where Adam and Eve was because God's omnipresent. He knows where everybody is. But you know what he was asking them? Where are you spiritually? Where are you spiritually? Because you have partaken of that which I commanded you not. So where are you? Do we ever examine ourselves? Do we ever ask ourselves that question? We ought to ask it every day of our lives. Where am I in relationship to God? What am I doing? And when there is a faithful gospel preacher and there are faithful elders and there are faithful Bible school teachers and faithful members of the Lord's kingdom and we are preaching the word of God and we are preaching in season... We are instant to do so. How, how long is it instant? <laughs> right now. Do it right now. Well, one of these days, I'll, I'll get around to that. No, do it now. Used to, I know that uh, when I was in, in, in preaching school, they taught me, you have a problem in the congregation, you preach about it. 
And if that person comes up and says, well, you know, you really stepped on my toes today. I think you're preaching right at me, preacher. If you keep doing that, I'm not going to come back. You might say, well, I'm aiming a little higher than that. I want to hit the heart. I want to hit the mind. But I can't back off. I can't say, no, it's not going to happen because I guarantee you I will. And I know most of these men will too. You better appreciate those that will do it. You better uh, thank the Lord for them because there's a lot of people out there. All they want to do is just come and, and make everybody feel great and feel good and go on your way and say, hey, we'll see you later. Not right. Notice he goes on to say, out of season. But he says, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering. And how? And doctrine. Doctrine. It's a nasty word to some people, Dadake. It's a nasty word. Because that means the do's and the don'ts. That means what you must do and what you must not do. And people don't like to be told what they can do or not do. And that's the world we live in today, and especially in America. We're so used to having things our way and having it so easy, we're going to go about, well, that ain't the way I want it. That's not what I'm going to do. And we are a prideful people. We better get that out of our hearts and minds and come back and listen to what God has to say. And brethren, we need to understand that. But I want you to think about this. He says, do it, exhort with all long-suffering and doctrine, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust, if you let it go very long, this is what they're going to get used to, after their own lust shall heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth, and shall be turned unto what? Fables. Brother Brent made this point the other day, too, and I thought it was a very good one. I had it in my notes, and, and I'm going to go ahead and use it. Stories. Well, I use illustrations. I tell stories about myself when I was little, young, things like that. I can get away with that at home. But you know something? Time is precious. Time is precious. We need to get right to the point. We need to talk about the gospel of Christ. We need to teach people... And when you teach them what they need to hear, they're going to respond one way or the other. They're either going to maybe say, I'll think about it, or they're going to say, no, I'm not going to do it, or they will obey and they will do what God says. That is what we need to do. And then some will just turn away their ears. But if it goes on very long, what are they going to do? All you have to do is look through some of our brotherhood papers or on the Internet. Everything's pretty much free nowadays. When people are needing a preacher in their congregation, what do they do? They, they put out a little advertisement. Now, we want this, and we want this, and we want this, and we want this, and we want somebody highly evangelistic. And we want somebody, you know, that's going to be a great pulpit man or something like that. I remember going to one congregation one time when I was young, and, and the elders there said, you know, um, and they had this great big bus program, and while I was trying to preach that day, there were kids, I'm not lying, they were literally calling up to the pulpit there, and nobody was watching them, two or three busloads of them. And I, I want little children in the assembly, I want them there. But nobody watching them. And things were very chaotic. And uh, the elders said, well, you know, we just can't control all of that, we can't help that. But we got them there, we got them there, and, and we're going to have a basket dinner, and we're going to have, we got a little gymnasium over here, and and man, I, I looked at that, and, and the elders got with me after I quit preaching that night, and they said, you know, we just might be interested in you. And I said, well, I'm not interested in you. And they said, well, that's pretty harsh. And I said, well, you need somebody that's a little more excited about your bus program and your gymnasium than me. I said, because all, all I would accomplish if I come here would be to split you. <laughs> that's what I would accomplish. They said, well, maybe we better rethink that. And I said, no thought about it. I'm good. I'm going home. <laughs> That's it. And I, I'll tell you where it is later if you want to know. I don't know whether they're still there or not. But after their own lust shall heap to themselves teachers having itchy ears. That's all some people want to hear. Just after dinner speeches, how good they are, how good everything is in the world, and no problems at all. The results of weak preaching we find in 2 Timothy chapter 4 and in verse 1. And when you look at 2 Timothy chapter 4 
And in verse 1, what do you see? When he said, I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing in his kingdom. And the fact is that there are those. Look at chapter 3. Boom back to chapter 3 in 2 Timothy. I know this also, that in perilous time shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce. And incontinent means no self-control, by the way. And uh, fierce despisers of those that are good. That's what weak preaching does. That's the mindset it puts in some people. When you have people that will tickle your ears, that's where you end up. And you think it can't happen to you? Think again, because you become acclimated sometimes to the false teach weak preaching. We become acclimated. You've heard the old story of the frog in the pot. I don't have to tell it again. You all heard it. But the fact is, that's where we end up. That's how things happen. Well, I better move on. Preaching what people like to hear, peace, joy, love, etc., those are good things. But we've got to go beyond that. We've got to preach about hell. Old-time preachers say they preach hellfire and brimstone. Well, I don't know if I like that term, but I will tell you this. I can tell you about heaven. I can tell you you're all going to get there, and I can tell you you're all going to get there easy, and it's going to be a good route and all that stuff. You don't have to worry about it. But if I shun to declare unto you the horror of hell, then I make the cross of Christ of none effect. Because Christ himself told about hell. And brethren, I can't describe it any better than Jesus did. But if we could just take the lid off of hell and you could smell the stench, you could hear the cries, you could see the things that were happening, I don't believe I would have to say very much. I think each and every individual here would turn their life around and want to go to heaven. But you see, we need to preach on those things we don't like to hear. And hell is not a bad word. It is a place where the ungodly are going to end up in eternity. Now think about eternity. I can't describe it. I don't have the vocabulary. I don't have the ability. I'm not smart enough to describe to you the term eternity. It's endless. And even I'm using a time term there. It's just endless. But you and I do not want to go there. But we need to preach on hell and those things. Well... Even in the New Testament, go to Galatians chapter 5, verses 1 to 4. Judaizers who sought to return Christians to the law of Moses made the cross of none effect. Well, you know what? We can go back to the old law. The whole book of Hebrews, when you really look at it, study it, it's about the writer of the book of Hebrews. I don't know who it was, probably Paul, but I don't know that. It doesn't matter. It's inspired of God. But those Jews that were Christians thought it was going to be easier to drift back into Judaism. And so what were they doing when they were teaching other brethren there, okay, let's go back, let's do this. They were falling away from Christ. In Galatians chapter 5, verses 1 through 4, he said, Stand fast therefore in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again with a yoke of bondage. Behold, I, Paul, say unto you, that if ye be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. You know what was happening? Some of our brethren, Jewish brethren, were trying to tell the Gentiles, you can't be saved unless you're circumcised. Now, you know, in Acts 15, the apostles went up to Jerusalem. They were there with the other apostles and such as that. And the Holy Ghost, through them, said, no, circumcision is not going to avail anything one way or the other. No, you go back and tell the Gentiles, no other burden shall be placed upon you. And I want you to think about this. Behold, I say unto you that if you be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. For I testify again to every man that is circumcised that he is debtor to the whole law. Christ has become of no effect unto you, whosoever you are that justified by the law. You are fallen, what? From grace. 
made the cross of Christ of none effect because you placed upon these Gentiles the idea that they have to be circumcised. That's Judaizers who sought to return Christianity and try to relate it back to the Old Testament. Sectarians who divided the church. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 10 through 15. Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye shall speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that ye be perfectly joined together in the same mind and the same judgment. For it hath been declared unto me of you, my brethren, by them which are of the house of Chloe, that there are contingents among you. Now this I say, that every one who saith, I am of Paul, and I am of Apollos, I have Cephas, and I have Christ, is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Were ye baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I baptized none of you, but Crispus and Gaius, lest any should say that I had baptized in mine own, notice this, name. In other words, want followers? Some people wanted followers. I want you to follow me. I want you to look at me, and I want you to go along with me in whatever I do. Sectarian again, bringing about division in the Lord's body because people wanted the preeminence. We know people in the New Testament that wanted the preeminence. We could name them. Alexander the Coppersmith, Diotrephes, you name it. They wanted the preeminence. Didn't care what they had to do to get it as long as I get recognition. And I'm convinced. I'm convinced that some of these people were my friends at one time in the board's body. That all they wanted, they would write a book and apologize for the church, the body of Christ, and said, oh, I know we're sectarian, and I know we're this, and I know we're that. Rubel Shelley is his name, one of them. It's just one. He was a good friend of mine. Not anymore. He's gone off. He's working for the devil. And the fact is, he apologized for us being so dogmatic. And he's still doing it today. You notice where he's at today. You notice where he's at today. He's so far removed from the body of Christ, it's pitiful. Out in Lubbock, Texas, uh, one of my teachers in, in the Kansas City School of Preaching, Doug Parsons, broke my heart. He goes out to Lubbock, Texas. He goes there to a very liberal congregation. He ends up right now in a community church. You see how sad things can get? because people want the preeminence. What about in a congregation when there are people that won't speak to each other and they're divided? Paul said, this is not good. It can't be sectarianism. A divided church will not work. Be of one mind. Be of one judgment. On judgment on what? The word of God. Then you have the Gnostics who elevated human wisdom above the wisdom of God. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 18 through 29. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved it is the power of God, for it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of the world? Hath not God made foolishness the wisdom of the world? God said they're foolish. How did they get foolish, Bill? Well, the fact is, when you think about Gnostics, what do you think about? You think about someone that says, well, you know, it really doesn't, and this was their doctrine, really doesn't matter what I do in the flesh. And you know, I see this today. People say, oh, that, that was back in the New Testament. We don't have that anymore. Let me update you on some things. Do you know people that claim to be religious, but out of their mouth come cuss words? Out of their mouth comes fornication? Out of their body they live in, they drink, and they do every alcohol, and they take drugs, they do whatever they want to do. Well, it really don't matter in the flesh what you do. After all, you're saved by grace. I had family members, I know this to be true, that took drugs, died in a drunken stupor. And the fact is, you know what they said? Well, they were saved back then, you know. Once saved, always saved. False doctrine, false teaching. Gnosticism to its end. You can't beat it. It's still alive today. And people have the idea, do whatever I want with this flesh because the grace of God is going to prevail. And it shows God's grace. And it glorifies God. Look at Romans chapter 6. 
Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. Cannot happen, cannot be. Gnosticism, no, will not work. I want you to think about something else. I have a lot more on that, but a couple other points I want to get to here. Worldly members who live immorally by preaching is not always done in the pulpit like I'm doing right now. You preach by your life. Upon our hearts and our minds are written the word of God. Not on tablets of stone, but in the heart. And all men know and read that epistle. That's what Paul says, Second Corinthians. So here's the point. We need to be an example. We need to live a faithful Christian life so others will see our lives as a Christian. I'm going to say something here, and a lot of people, I hope I have time to, to get through and explain myself. There is a difference in being a member of the Lord's Church and being a Christian. I hope you get this. A Christian is going to live Christ-like. Some members of the church don't. As a matter of fact, some have been withdrawn from, some need to be withdrawn from, and some are just going about doing whatever they want to do, and nobody says or does anything. And when we live an immoral life, when we go against the will of God, we're not living as a Christian. You want to be Christ-like, you're going to have to follow Christ to the cross. And you're going to have to live like Jesus. You're going to have to take up your cross daily, and you're going to have to bear it. And through that is going to come some suffering, some pain, and people saying things about you. But you are preaching a sermon, are members of the body of Christ. Don't be caught. Don't be out doing the things that the world does and expect God to accept. First Corinthians chapter 5, 1 through 3, it is reported commonly that there is fornication among you, and such fornication is not so much as even named among the Gentiles, that one should have his father's wife. And ye are what? Notice this. Puffed up. Puffed up. You accept it. You go along with it. You don't want to do anything about it. And have not rather mourned. It should break your heart. You shouldn't glory in it. Our heart should be broken over someone that is doing such as that. And such fornication is not so much as named among the Gentiles that one should have his father's wife. And ye are puffed up and have not rather mourned that he that had done this deed might be taken away from among you. For I verily am absent in the body, but present in the spirit, have judged already as though I were present concerning him that hath so done that deed. Now, it's kind of removed from the pulpit and put upon all Christians, isn't it? That we all need to live that moral life. What about the materialist who denied the resurrection? 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 12 through 9. Oh, there is no resurrection of the dead. Came from the Pharisees or Sadducees. That's where that idea, that's where that doctrine came from. Some wouldn't give it up, even though perhaps they had become members of the Lord's church. But they were not going to give up the idea. We don't believe in a resurrection. We don't believe in that. And so what did they do? They infiltrated the Lord's body. And they tried to tear up the Lord's church, the kingdom, the body of Christ, because of their false teaching. Brethren, that's where we stand today with some of these individuals. And there are those today that, and it's been taught this week, uh, and a great, wonderful job has been taught, there is a resurrection if there wasn't a resurrection, then you and I did not bother. I would not be here today. I have other things I'd rather be doing because I have no hope. My preaching today is vain, is what Paul tells me. Those who compromised with error. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 14 through 17. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers, for what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? And what concord hath Christ with Baal? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. And as God has said, I will dwell in them, and I will walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. 
Wherefore come ye out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I, notice this, will receive you. You want God to receive you? You want God to say unto you on that day of judgment, enter into the joy of the Lord? Or he's going to say, depart from me, doers of iniquity. But then there are those who also will nullify or make vain the cross of Christ when they profane the Lord's Supper. I know this isn't the only part of worship, but it's a very important part. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 18 to 29. First of all, when you come together in the church, I hear that there be divisions among you, and partially I believe it. And then he goes on and talks about that. When you come together, therefore, unto one place, this is not to eat the Lord's Supper. For in eating, everyone taketh before others his own supper. Everyone was changing the Lord's Supper into a common meal. They were not looking out for their brothers. They were polluting. They were destroying. They were making the cross of Christ of none effect because they certainly was not worthily partaking of the Lord's Supper. And these things ought not to be. Numerous antichrist were also among the saints. Now that word anti means against. Look at 1 John chapter 2. Look at verse 18. Little children, it is the last time and ye as have heard that the Antichrist shall come, even now are they many. There are those that are against Christ. Those that claim, well, he, didn't, he wasn't resurrected from the dead. He wasn't uh, the Christ that you think that he was. After all, all he really was is a prophet. You ever hear of a religion that teaches Jesus is only a prophet? You know you have. You know you have. Skeptics who deny the incarnation. Look at First John chapter two, two verses. Uh, John chapter four, excuse me. First John chapter four, verses two through three. Whereby know ye the spirit of God? Every spirit that confesseth that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. And notice this: and every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. And that is that spirit of the antichrist, which ye have heard that it should come and even now already is in the world it was then there and it's here now there are those that claim that Jesus Christ did not come in the flesh they deny the incarnation many were spiritually indifferent we can't become spiritually indifferent because when we do we make the cross of Christ of none effect if the cross of Christ means anything to us means we need to be active and out there Converting souls to Christ so they too can go to heaven, so they can understand what the cross is all about. Look at Revelation chapter 2, verses 14 through 16. But I have a few things against thee, because thou hast them that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel to eat things sacrificed unto idols and to commit fornication. So hast thou also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, Notice this, God says by inspiration, which things I hate. And he says, repent or else I will come unto thee and I will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. Yes, friends, there are and there is and there will always be the cross of Christ. And that is the only thing that you and I are going to be able to go through in order to get to heaven. It has been preached this week, it has been taught this week, and it will continue throughout the lectureship. And I want to thank every individual, every person here that listens intently, and I want to thank all the gospel preachers here that are teaching the truth. At least we know, and Tony and I have talked about this, you know, Tony and I are the oldest ones on this lectureship, I think. Is that right, Tony? Surely there's somebody older. No, no. No. Three weeks ahead of me <laughs> but we're a young 65 aren't we anyway thank you so much for your attention appreciate it